Today we continue in Romans chapter 4, as we started last week, discussing Paul's dissection of faith. Remember I pointed out to you that throughout the whole book, Paul has talked a lot about how crucial faith is to salvation. Remember also that we pointed out that in chapter 1, verse 16, he states that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And I said to you, as I often repeat, not contains the power of God or channels the power of God, <clears throat> but is itself the power of God. Then in chapter 3, verse 22, he writes that the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That's why last week I asked you, what is that faith exactly? And I told you that Paul frames this whole chapter around three questions. How was Abraham saved? When was Abraham saved? And what were the elements of Abraham's saving faith? Now I want to finish answering that question today that I began last week. What were the elements of Abraham's saving faith? And I told you that we had to remember that the wickedness of the world at that time had gotten really bad and had come to a head. With the building of a gigantic tower as a declaration of independence from God called the Tower of Babel. It was a brazenly defiant act, so God scattered the nations into language groups. At that point in history, God chose a man named Abram to father a nation through whom he promised one day he would bring salvation to the world. The problem, however, was that Abraham and his wife were in their 70s when they received the promise. And they had no kids, and they continued that way until they were in their 90s. Now that's why in verses 18 and 19, they begin with the concept of hope, which is a fundamental precept to our faith. And he says in verse 18, against all hope. Against what? All hope. Not just against hope, not just against a little bit of hope, but against all hope. So why does he say that? Because how much hope can you really have when you're 90? You give up all hope for obvious reasons. Yet it says Abraham in hope believed. What did he hope in? He hoped in God and he put all of everything that he had into that one thing. In other words, he didn't put his hope in anything that he saw or believed about physiology or biology. Instead, he put his hope only in the Almighty's non-natural promise. Remember that. It is important. Verse 19 says that the result of his proof of faith was that he became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. So I showed you right here last week that we see faith's object, God's promise. So what do you focus on? God's promise. What do you focus on in the midst of problematic situations or dealing with the unknown or when you're afraid? The Lord's promise. Not your circumstances and not your fear. You focus on the promises of God that appear in a string of words that have been revealed by the Almighty. If we live on the basis of faith and not sight, you can't operate, you can't reason on the basis of how you experience this world. That is called faithlessness. Now I know that it is paramount, it is what most people live according to, but the Bible says that if you live that way, and you approach God that way, you go to hell for it. It's that serious. So in Abraham's case, 
from that point on, Abraham started walking around with the expectation that he would soon have a child. Even though his wife was barren and they were both almost 100 years old. So look in verses 20 and 22 because it tells us why Abraham was successful. Because he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And then he says, this is precisely why it was credited to him as righteousness. So this is what I want you to see right here. Faith's object is the promise of God brought about by the power of God. Meaning that you must never factor the power of God out of any situation. Choose a difficult situation, anyone you'd like. Whether you get a bad diagnosis or you lost your job, whatever it is. Now with that fixed in your mind, what you must do is not factor the power of God out and act like you can't do anything or that you're in trouble. In fact, the opposite is true. By an act of the will, you interject the power of God into the situation, believing that God has the power to do what he has promised. Which leads us to the next element that we have in Abraham's faith. Faith's foundation focus is God's power. It says in verse 19, without weakening in his faith. Everybody see that? Without what? Yeah, because the first thing we do when things go bad is we go, oh no. If we can't reason to the appropriate outcome and isolate the processes that will get us there, we lose hope. But it says, even though Abraham didn't have anything, physically speaking, there was no way that he could bring this about. It didn't cause the weakening of his faith. It says, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. There were a lot of things that Abraham could have thought about as he considered his future. A lot of things that could have discouraged him. But he didn't think about those things. Instead, he chose to focus only on God's power. Do you see what he did? He trusted in the Lord and no one else, not even himself. But depending on the Lord alone like that can be scary. But Abraham did it. Most of us prefer a faith where we depend a little bit upon God and a little bit upon ourselves. If this promise were made to us, we would be saying, okay, God, thanks. And we'd head right toward the doctor and say, what kind of pills does she need and what do I need to take? And then we'd go home and we'd get on the internet and we'd begin to look for home remedies. And you know what we'd search? How to have kids in your 90s. <laughs> in other words, we would want to hedge our bet. You ever done that? We're hoping that God keeps his promise, but we have other ways of getting it done if he doesn't, just like Abraham did with Hagar. Today, in what ways do we hedge our bets? Or what ways do we hedge our faith? Let me give you three. First, by refusing to embrace our new identity. Like I told you a couple of weeks ago, many of us walk around with a dull, vague sense of guilt, disapproval, and fear, feeling like we can't forgive ourselves and that we still need to prove ourselves. But this is refusing to believe what God has already done. Listen to me, please. You are forgiven. 
Maybe you need to say that to yourself right now, and you probably need to say it every day. I am forgiven. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more than he already does. And it is time to embrace that and just worship God for it. The moment you obeyed the gospel, you became a chosen son or daughter of God. And what does that mean? It means, among other things, that you have been appointed to walk in victory. All of your needs will be supplied. You will reign with Christ forever. Nothing can overcome you. No weapon can be formed against you. When you face no matter what, you will triumph. All those against you will ultimately fall. And surely, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. In all of these earthly trials, God is working in you an eternal weight of glory. Is this how you walk through life? The second way that we hedge our bet is by failing to face tomorrow in the confidence of God's promises. Now like Abraham, you think that your past failures define your future. But faith says, my future is not determined by my past, but by the promises of God, backed by the power of God. People, are, people sometimes who are considering Christianity will ask me and say something like this. I just don't think I can live this out. But in saying that, the focus is on you. The focus of your faith should no longer be your power, but his. The Christian life is not you for Jesus, but it's Jesus in you. In you. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 when he says, Christ lives in me. Where does he live? In me. If Christ lives in you, you can't be weak. And you can't be foolish and ignorant and lazy. You can't. If Christ really believes in you, you can't. And Paul says, it really is Jesus in you. He becomes the power in your fight. A third way that we hedge our bet is in refusing to completely obey. You ever been guilty of that? We don't do things God's way because we're not confident enough in him to go all the way. Let me remind you of something that you probably know very well. It's something that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. And I'll paraphrase. He said, I risk everything on the truth of the gospel. The choices I made, the sacrifices, if God's promises aren't true, I am a fool. And most of us would say, I hope the gospel is true. But when we say that, we're still making choices that we think will bring us happiness if it's not true. If you're a teenager or a college student, you want to belong to Jesus, but not enough to fully surrender. So you keep one hand on the world and another on Jesus. For some of you, it is your career. God has told you to let go of that. It's not worth worshiping at the altar of work, but you're hedging. For some of you, it's your relationship to the church. You say, I know I need God and I need to be involved at church, but I just don't want to join and commit. It's just too messy. And it takes a lot of time. So whatever our focus goes from God to us, we begin to hedge our bet. <coughs> now, in verses 20 and 21, we see, thirdly, faith's boast. God's trustworthiness. It says that he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he'd promised. 
Remember we saw that a while ago? He was fully what? Persuaded. We would say today, he's convinced beyond a shadow of the doubt. So that is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness. This is the basis for everything that we stand for. This is the, the bedrock of the gospel. A big theme for Paul and Romans is what we boast in. If we're saved by works, he says, we can, we can boast in what we have accomplished. But if we're saved by faith, we can only boast about what God has done. Think about this. If Abraham had had kids in his own strength when he was 90 years old, he would have said, I am mega man. I'm a beast. But as it stands, when you meet Abraham in heaven, he's not going to be talking about what a rare male specimen he was when he was on earth. When you meet him in heaven, he's going to say, I was a miserable, dried up man at 50 years old. God did it all, and he gets the glory. If any of your salvation came from your own strength, when you get to heaven, you could boast about all that you overcame. But nobody in heaven is going to be walking around with a narcissistic Nike t-shirt on that says something like, fear me, or I'm a beast, or I am awesome. No. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4 says, and I paraphrase, we literally will have his name on our foreheads. Our boast will be totally in him. Our boast is not about us. Our story is his glory. So finally, the last element of Abraham's faith is faith's strength. Faith's strength. Weakness. Now that's certainly counterintuitive. But verse 20 says, he did not waver in unbelief. Now that's an odd statement to make about Abraham because most certainly he did waver in his faith. Not once, but twice Abraham lied and told some king that Sarah was his sister to protect himself. Once with Pharaoh and then again with Abimelech. What kind of person does this? Everyone. And then in Genesis chapter 16, he gets impatient and takes matters into his own hands and sleeps with Hagar to try to accomplish things naturally. These all sound like wavering to me. And it's not like Paul didn't know these things. Yet he said, Abraham did not waver in unbelief. I don't know about you, but I find that comforting. It means you don't have to be unflinching in your faith to walk with God. Scripture is filled with stories of great saints who wavered. Read the book of Job, whom God called the most righteous man on the face of the earth. He wavered. Peter, the future leader of the church, wavered over and over again. Once on top of the waves. Again, he did it in John chapter 6. And then three times he denied Jesus. Again in Galatians chapter 2, when Paul had to rebuke him, when Peter slipped back into ethnocentrism. This is all so very comforting to me. But why would Paul, despite all the ways Abraham failed and faltered, say he did not waver in unbelief? Because Paul understood that faith is not never falling, but always looking to Jesus when you do. Why is Abraham here in Romans chapter 4 in this great discussion of faith? Because Abraham is the picture of the guy mentioned in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16. It says specifically, the righteous man falls seven times. This is Abraham. 
The faith itself might be weak, but the object is most secure. Now, here is the result of this kind of faith. Righteousness. How are you presented to be righteous before God? Through faith. Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. How possible is it? Impossible. But what kind of faith are we talking about? We're talking about the type of faith described here through these elements of Abraham's faith. We must all possess them. Look in verses 23 to 25 as it describes this type of righteousness. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Everybody look. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us. Do you see that? To whom God credits righteousness. Who does it? God. We don't do it for ourselves. God does it. It's a judicial decree as he looks down at us and he examines our faith. But it's linked to Jesus. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over for death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Faith is merely the hand that lays hold of Jesus. Remember I asked you the question as we began this series? People ask, what's the big deal about Jesus? Well, this is the big deal about Jesus. It's the admission that you cannot save yourself. But God has kept his promise and did it for you. That though you are faithless, he was faithful. Faith declares that though you are unrighteous, God was gracious. And though you are powerless, he is powerful. That he is faithful and just in all of his ways. And by the way, this faith is what will propel you outward into the mission of God. Now, every one of us, and that includes me, your servant, has to have a ministry in which you are involved personally. You don't just attend worship services and go to Bible class. You have your own personal ministry that you labor in daily. This type of faith is what propels you outward, not looking at yourself or focusing on your needs, but the needs of others. And one thing I noted as I read Romans chapter 4 this week is how Paul seems to brim with anticipation about what God will do over and over again. He keeps saying in verses 11, 12, 16, 17, and 18 that God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that he would have all of these descendants and that this message is for all people of every nation everywhere. Paul is confident that the God who raised Jesus from the dead will keep his promise to bring salvation to the entire earth. You see, his confidence in God's promise about salvation didn't stop with his own salvation. It extended to seeing others come to know the good news. And that is going to give Paul confidence to go and share with other people because he knows that God has promised to save people from every tribe and every tongue and he'll keep his word to bring salvation to everyone who believes. He will surely keep his word to extend salvation to every tribe and every tongue. You see, the whole Christian life is started and sustained by faith in God's promise. So as I begin to close, let me make sure that we all understand. Faith is not a, a general belief in God or in Jesus. 
It is confidence in what he has promised that he will remove our sin debt and that he will turn us into righteous people. And then we, therefore, will lean all of our weight upon that. Faith is not a flawless life. Like Abraham, there will likely be many stumbles. But faith is not never stumbling. It's getting back up and looking to Jesus and keeping his promise to do what he said he will do when we do that. So when you think about Romans 4, the question you should have is, do I have this kind of faith? Have I rested all of my hopes, all of my dreams on a finished work of Christ? And remember that I told you there are only two categories of people. Those who believe and rest in it and those who don't. And that was the message that was given from the beginning and it's the message that we still teach people today. There is no name under heaven by which or through which anyone can ever be saved except Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. To this very day, he is with us. He loves you more than you could ever know. He wants you to be successful in life, but success in life is not how the world defines it. It is how God does. And if you want to be successful, then you become obedient to his word and you live and you think and you treat others the way Jesus did. And you don't have to do it perfectly. You just have to try. And so we say, to the only eternal, immortal, and invisible God, who alone is wise, the church says, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If the shepherds can be of service to you today, please, if you'd like to make something known to the congregation, you can come forward. Or if you'd like some prayers in private, you may go in the back and meet one of them there. Or if you've never come to Jesus today and you'd like to, and you'd like to become obedient to the gospel by being ultimately baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins where you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we as always provide this opportunity to you as we all stand and sing.